I'm Dorian Kim, as Theo mentioned. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the control architecture for agile legged robots. Can you see that the, the my slide? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, let's start. My research goal is to create the control architectures for agile legged robots operating in the real world, like this talk, to make the robot to do some things good for humanity, save the their life and enhance the productivity. And the reason why I say that the architecture, I use the architecture, is because I believed Agile Legged Locomotion Controller has the hierarchical structure. So motion planner plan the uh, entire body motions. And there is the middle level controller, such as the whole body control, coordinating the each, each linked motions. and the joint level controller managing the actuator. In the case of the uh, in the case of the human it is muscle. In the case of the robot, it's a motor or hydraulic actuator. When I design the control architecture, I'm mostly focusing on the robotic systems, the entire system overall performance. So instead of the rather than Visiting the, the component by component, I tried to make um, find the fu <clears throat> fundamental function of the, each component in the context of the entire system and develop the analytical tool, analysis tool to evaluate the entire system performance. And based on that analysis, I innovate, formulate the controller, designing the hardware sometimes, and enhance the individual components. Today, I'm going to present the three control architecture I developed uh, previously. And the first architecture is about my PhD work. <coughs> Passive anchor by hidden robot. So the motivation of this project is, can be summarized with this video. This is the Alpha Robotics Challenge and then this robot got the second prize. Uh, I like this robot, I love these teams, but I wanna show this video to let you feel that the speed of the humanoid robot and feel that uh, how much time you need to wait until this robot taking a one step and one step. So it is kind of not common to see that the actual robot speed is because people usually speed up their video clip, but <clears throat> this is a state of art humanoid locomotion speed. The reason why this is not as good as our locomotion speed is because the humanoid robot rely too much on, uh, in my opinion, to the statically stable uh, status state. So they use the anchor actuation and they have a flat feel. So I decided to remove the both of these. And this is the point put bipedal robot, Hume, and uh, it's the beginning of my PhD. At that time, there is no locomotion planner for this type of the robot. So I start from the, started from developing the foot placement planner. Uh, I name it the time to velocity reversal planner. It calculating the, it finding the best landing location by watching that the central mass state in real time. And there is the whole body control to make the robot uh, make uh, find the torque command to make this swing motion is executed. And the computed torque command goes into the joint level torque controller. And this joint level torque feedback controller calculate the final command which is current for the uh, actuator. And it works well in simulation. Here is the dynamic simulation. As you can see, this robot can stepping over the seven centimeter obstacle and stepping down from that obstacle without failing. And it's pretty robust to the certain level of the disturbance. Okay, seems like everything looks good. 
So I implement this to the real robot and test it. And this is the result. This is a failure and failure and failure. I need to find the fine-tuned parameters. I need to fight against the noise and bandwidth and also maintenance too. And here is more. Here is the hundred failures. And I do this do this test more than a year. Then guess that how much failure I must have seen to get this couple of the success. Uh, let me tell the truth. Uh, this is also not perfect. It's uh, 4 a.m. Uh, that's why I wearing the, this uh, not formal suit. Uh, the maximum number of the steps I got uh, at that time was 18. But believe it or not, this was the most advanced dynamic locomotion using whole body control. And it also showed that the potential of my algorithms, uh, locomotion planner and whole body control. And I decided to make this uh, make these two things uh, more perfect to get the completed uh, locomotion capability. Okay, since I'm going to uh, use the whole body control, keep mentioning the whole body control, let us let me briefly explain what it is. There are three components in whole body control. One is the floating-based dynamics. So humanoid robot technically floating in the air. There is, if you drop the humanoid robot in the air, then it must go fall to the, fall to the down infinitely. But it's not because there is the contact constraint. The humanoid robot can get the reaction force from the contact point. And we need some, we need to specify some task. So we want to control the central mass of the robot, control the hand of the robot, and whole body control merging these three components and calculate the torque command to execute the, the commanded task. It's a dynamically consistent formulation, which means that this formulation can address the account the entire body dynamics of the robot, and it's easy to reconfigure. So you can easily add one more task or take off the task. That's why all the team in the Data Works Challenge has the, some form of the whole body control. And uh, the whole body control I used has the unique features, which is the execution of the prioritized task. When you do the, the sum task with your humanoid robot, your task must not be the single. Your task is going to be the multiple. You wanna make sure that the robot is balanced but also want to do the some manipulation. Sometimes you want to make a robot walk. So if there is the multiple task, uh, then highly likely the robot cannot accomplish the all the task. So we prioritize the task, make sure that the first priority task is always executed, and the last one is the also executed as long as it does not violate the first task. I use the null space projection method. There are multiple other uh, techniques you can use, but I use null space projection me uh, method because it's the computation and cheapest method. And how it works is relatively simple. So here is the user input. Uh, it starts from the contact. So contact is defined by that the point the contact point must not have any acceleration. There is no motion. And there is the desired motion for the first task and desired motion to the second task. Can you see my cursor? Okay. And the something we need to find is the acceleration, configuration acceleration. And this part is given by the encoders and IMU. This is velocity of the configuration. Okay, once we have the set up the this equation, 
the only thing we need to do is taking the inverse. This is the little special inverse, dynamically consistent inverse, but technically basic inverse. And calculate the first Jacobi, uh, first acceleration. Uh, contact uh, acceleration coincide with the zero acceleration on the contact point. So this QC double dot means that uh, there is no acceleration, there is no motion in the contact point. And then you add up this uh, acceleration coming uh, calculated for first test. And it's again the Jacobian inverse. But before taking the inverse, we need to project the first task Jacobian to the null space of the previous Jacobian. So now you can see the NC. So once you uh, once you project the, the first task Jacobian to the previous contact Jacobian, then this Q1 double dot does not violate previous motion constraint. As I said, previous motion constraint is zero acceleration at the contact point. And do this again and again. Then we'll get the prioritized task motion. So how it works, here is the example. So I put the centroid angular momentum task in a different place. Centroid angular momentum task is basically minimizing the entire body angular moment. If we put if I put it in the middle of the these two tasks, then it the robot move like the left hand side uh, motion. So you can see that uh, arm is the react to this the body orientation to minimize the entire body angular momentum. But if I put it in under the joint position, then you cannot see the, any of this natural arm motion. Of course, I did a handcraft this arm motion. Okay, this is the 10 minute lecture for whole body control. Every, everything is good. Okay, let's move on. So noise space projection is good to reduce the computation time, but it also has the limitation. Noise space projection uh, only handle the equality constraint. So you cannot understand the inequality uh, constraint. Which means that whole body controller believe that the foot is the anchored on the ground. So sometimes whole body control finding the solution, try to pulling the ground, which is physically impossible. And uh, it cannot handle the friction cone constraint. To handle this inequality constraint, then you need to solve the quadratic programming, which is optimization algorithm. Here, I keep the noise space projection algorithm in the other task except the center of mass and the reaction force calculation. So I minimize the size of the quadratic optimization uh, problems, quadratic programming problems to the only the center of mass. And I do that the, all the other task prioritization with the noise space projection. And in this simulation, this simulation result show that uh, it is a computation and efficient and do that uh, some things what I want to do. Uh, all this uh, simulation calculation is done in the 0.6 milliseconds on my laptop. So it's a, one of the most computationally robust and efficient whole body control. So I name it the whole body dynamic control. Okay, we have a I, better whole body control. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you a question? So this is Frank, I'm just gonna open my video. Um, Course. The what, once you do QP, do you still need to do this null spacing? Why can can you just not create a constraint in the QP solver and it will automatically deal with this null space stuff? So what the Q, when we compute the QP, there is no projection. There is no null space projection. Null space, so do null space first, projection. Yeah, noise space projections happens before this QP and after this QP. I see. I see. So yes, Does my question is whether it's, this could be rolled into the QP because because I think if you just put a constraint somewhere, I'm just wondering whether the QP would not simply do this for you. Uh, so the entire process is this. 
first, I calculate the Q double dot as I did in the noise space projection to address the contact part. And once that acceleration is fit into the quadratic programming, then QP calculate the center of mass motion and then finding the reaction first coincide with the center of mass motion. Once it determines the center of mass motions, then it's again another constraint. And then after yeah. that point, the North space projection based task priority uh, prioritization calculation is done, but it cannot violate the QP solution. Okay, and, um, thank you. Does it, does it make sense? I think we might have an offline discussion about it, um, but yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> So next things I visited is the torque feedback control. Originally, Hume used the integral control to reduce the torque tracking error. So as you know, the in, if you use integral control, then eventually the, the error is goes, uh, goes to zero. It's a nice to get the accurate torque feedback control, but as a cost, as a you know, cost of that accuracy, I need to pay uh, compensate the stability. I want to maintain the accuracy, but don't want to pay for that stability. So I decided to introduce the actuator model and using the disturbance observer and do the page margin analysis. Page margin means that how much room to how much um, how the how much room to uh, get the more time delay? Let me put this in a way. So how sensitive is the controller to the time delay in the feedback loop? So larger is better. Larger means that the this controller can endure the more time delay. Before I analyze the all the compare the all the controller, I first make sure that the, these different control architecture uh, controllers has the same accuracy, which you can find in the magnitude plot. And as you can see, every controller has the uh, similar magnitude behavior, which means that the accuracy is similar. And I calculate the page margin at this uh, parameter setups. Here is the oh, page uh, margin between- I have a quick question. Uh, so mm -hmm. I believe this analysis is more, it, it depends on the uh, selection of the task. And even within the same task, uh, it might depend on the other variables, such as the phase of the motion. So uh, what's task and what is your assumption here? So this is only about the single actuator. And this is only about the torque tracking. So there is no high level multi-degree of freedom robot here. How did you define the uh, target torque? Different torque trajectory might give you different numbers. So this is the uh, chop signal. So it's sweeping that uh, all the frequency. So it's a sinusoidal motion start from the this slow signal and then the testing the high speed, high frequency uh, command. And it plot the magnitude and the phase of the output of the actuator. Thank you. Uh, and of course, in this uh, result, PDM has the PD control has the best performance in terms of the pace margin. But as you can see, magnitude in the row frequency is uh, small, which means that it has the more error in the row frequency. So the targeted controller is just the PD plus disturbance observer versus PD plus integral control. They sharing the same accuracy, but disturbance observer based controller has much better stability. Okay, great. So now we have a better torque feedback controller, better whole body controller. Now time to assemble these two. And this is the result. So you can see I'm so frustrated with this result. 
there is nothing better. So, so as you can see, body posture is still unstable, which results in difficulty in swing foot control and body state estimation. Okay, how should I do? So I go back to that uh, fundamental problem. So symptoms is very simple. Symptoms is the inaccurate the central mass data estimation. This is the plot of the central mass velocity. You can, as you can see, it's a complete noise. There is no trend or whatsoever. And because of the unstable central mass control, I also cannot control the foot landing locations very well. Okay, I need to make this better, but as I did, as I said, I I do this all the torque control enhancement, whole body control formulation enhancement. So I must ask this first: What is the sufficiently small estimation and control error? And to get that answer for the questions, I decided to do that the uncertainty analysis based on the robust control uh, idea. Although robot dynamics is complicated, once it goes to that the locomotion level, balance control, then we can simplify this dynamics with this simple uh, inverted pendulum model. You can simplify the uh, position of the foot here and then make sure that your, uh, the robot's central mass height is constant by pushing this point with this prismatic joint actuator. Then the dynamics of the robot simplify to, to this equation, x double dot equals g over h times x minus p. Because this equation is so simple, we can even calculate the uh, analytical solutions. This show that uh, central mass state at the certain uh, time is defined by this equation with the initial, initial state and then contact point. The foot position. And when we determine that the constant swing time, then this locomotion behavior for, goes into the formulation time invariant linear distance, which is good because now it's a super simple system. We can use the, a lot of different control algorithms easily. And I introduced the two noise parameter, uncertainty parameter, here and here. This is added to the landing location, so it's a control input error. And this is added to the central mass state, so this is the estimation error. So the problems becomes that finding the boundary of these two noise parameters. What is the maximum boundary the system can handle uh, while guaranteeing the stability. Here, uh, the left-hand side of the picture show that uh, if there is no uncertainty whatsoever, then all the initial states can converge to the zero velocity state. So the controller is robust enough to make uh, every state converge to the uh, stable state. But if there is uncertainty, then we are going to get the some uncertain region, which point or which the region you cannot guarantee the stability. And this orange ball show that the uncertain region. Before I explain this uncertain region, let me explain uh, this blue region first. So this kind of the behavior is possible only when the robot leg is infinitely long. But truth is not, robot leg has the kinematic limit. Because of it, there is some state we cannot handle. So only this state inside of this blue region is feasible uh, given that the kinematic limit of the robot. And now you can see that the, this uncertain region is actually larger than the, this blue region. So all the feasible region is uncertain. We cannot guarantee the stability. And this region coincides with a 4.5 centimeter error in the landing location and three centimeter error in the central mass state estimation. Then 
what is the required errors to make this ball is a shrink down to this blue region. Landing location should be controlled in a point uh, 1.5 centimeter error, and the estimation error should be smaller than the two millimeter, which is way beyond my expectation. I didn't even know that the, this much accuracy should be targeted to make this robot is just maintain its balance. So I reformulate the entire uh, control structure. This is the original control structure. And I added kinematic level whole body control to calculate the position and velocity command for the joint. So I completely removed the torque feedback loop in the low level controller, joint level controller, because I know it makes the system is more compliant. It's good to have a compliant control but it's not good for having the high stiffness, high upgrade position control. And now the torque command computed in the dynamic level whole body control is goes into the low level control as the feed fold input. So there is no more feedback loop. And motor position controller is enabled, which is collocated the feedback control. It's actually a lot better than joint position control because the sensing part is right next to the actuator. And I updated the hardware. Uh, this structure is too weak. So if I holding the hip and I move the foot left and right, then it can easily deflect it more than the three centimeter. So I reinforced the structure of the hardware, change the IMU sensor, and change the, all the, the electronics. And this is the result. When we get this result, uh, Luis and I almost cried because it's a six year project. And then we saw that the, a lot of failures just fall down of the robot or more than the five years and then one day we got this result. It gave us the really valuable lessons. The one most important thing is that the controller must be based on the real system, fundamental problem of the actual robot. So even though you have a really good torque feedback controller, if your targeted motion is the high stiffness, the high accuracy position control, then you must not use the torque control. Focusing on the system performance, and of course, there's a lot more details, uh, which I don't, uh, I'm not going to explain here, but uh, all of them is so important small details to make this system is more perfect. And we are so excited and we throw the ball to the robot to test that the disturbance rejection uh, performance. And here you can see the Ruiz so excited to throw the ball. And I still maintain its balance. And this is a rough terrain locomotion, what I want to say. Uh, it is not very impressive in terms of the height variation, but this is kind of the challenging frame because I didn't stick to all these pads. So sometimes the pad is slip uh, together and sometimes the leg is stuck in the edge of the pad. You can see here, it's a slip, but it keeps replaning the landing location and then recovering the down. Uh, this is one of my favorite leaders because I get this in a week. I deploy the same controller to the new system with the different video freedom and the dynamic model. But oh, we accomplish this same locomotion behavior in a week without much change in the formulation or tuning. I really want to test this algorithm for in the humanoid robot. Uh, whole body control, that's the what whole body control is designed for, but expensive, hard to get, right? Just testing in the simulation. But this is a, a good 
three features, you can add a more task like uh, holding the cup or rotating the head while doing that uh, uh, commanded or conversion task. Okay, let's move on to the folder to the robot. So I bring the whole body control. I kind of the confidence that I, can, I can make this other robot also be better. But the problem of the whole body control is this one. Whole body control cannot understand the motion. It only see the one step forward. So the time horizon of the whole body control is the millisecond. Uh, this is the uh, critical cons if I want to make the robot run and jump. As I mentioned before, whole body controller need to have a three components, and one of them is contact constraint. Once the robot goes into the air, the whole body controller lose the controllability for that uh, center of mass control because there is no reaction force it can utilize. So whole body control must understand there is the upcoming landing and there is the upcoming jumping, which is done by the MPC very easily. See this uh, mini tira. You can see the mini tira keep jumping. It is a trunking base. This can be easily done by the MPC, model creative control. You can see that the entire uh, working motion, but it's the computationally expensive. It keeps opt solving the optimization problems in real time. So that's why people use the simplified model. That's why people use the uh, slow update frequency. And I want to maintain the just both uh, pros of the both controller. But the question is how? Whole body controller designed to track the desired tra uh, trajectory. So it's a position controller. But when we see the mini chira running, the contact period is only 0 0.09 seconds and the aerial pace is 0 0.6 seconds. So the period it can actually track the given trajectory is 0 0.9 seconds. So I decided to push the ground first as the MPC found and then keep the whole body posture as the second priority task. And I named it the whole body impulse control, which inspired by the impulse scaling algorithms used in the Chira 2 running control. And here is the control architecture. Uh, it's not special at all. Uh, many people use the whole body control and model fluid control together, and they put the model fluid control on top of the whole body control. Unique part is the whole body impulse control take the reaction force also as a one command. So it tracking the reaction force at the same time it track the desired uh, body posture. And this small additions enhance that the locomotion capability a lot. You can see that the MPC plus the whole body impulse control can show that a lot better balance uh, maintenance performance. And this is the locomotion when we use the only MPC for the control, which is not bad at all. Robot, but once you add a whole body impulse control, then this is the maximum speed in the case. This is the one of the fastest legged robots. Uh, in the world, and we saw that the 3.7 meter per second in maximum speed, and we cannot go above this. The actuator already stands all the force, and it's the power limit of the hardware. So, which means that uh, the control, this speed is not limited by controller. And the speed is limited by hardware. And another good thing is that this. Control architecture is general for any type of the robot. This is very preliminary result of the humanoid, but using the same controller, MPC and whole body impulse control. It's doing decent walking and also doing the decent running. Uh, we are keep improving this controller, but 
good evidence to show that the generality of the formulation. Okay, let's move on the vision part, perception part. So, so far, it's all about the blind walking. So, the controller believed that the surface is flat and there is nothing. But it's not, of course. And then uh, we can add a perception system to make sure that the robot understands the external environment and responds to that uh, variation. So, I added a localization sensor and depth camera to the to this robot. There is interesting small details in the hardware design as well, because it's kind of tricky to add a more sensor to this small robot. But let me focus only on the algorithm part in this presentation. So when I added the perception systems, I mainly focus on the speed of the, the perception uh, algorithm. So I only take the one point out of the thousand sample point and try to make sure that the, all the filtering and the height map generation is concise, as concise as possible. So we can detect this kind of the moving obstacle. And you can see the height map is real time height map generation and detect this moving uh, obstacle. This is my home happens in during the COVID. So I didn't do the a lot more extensive tests, but the update frequency is 90 hertz. And this 90 hertz is the update frequency of this depth camera. So algorithms only taking a couple of milliseconds to finishing the all this height map generation process. And this is the preliminary result again. In here, Sira can detect uh, these wood obstacles and changing the stepping location and, the location. and once it meets that uh, too high obstacle so it cannot make a this obstacle and make jump that's the idea of this And again, this obstacle height is uh, around 7 cm, and the luminous swing height of the Minichira is around 4 cm. So if you can, if Minichira cannot see these obstacles without building the height map, then it cannot uh, walk over the exploring this space. It has the basic obstacle avoidance feature, but it becomes better and better. Here is the posture adaptation uh, feature, and also the robot can stepping over the stair, although it's only simulation. And this is the real-time A star pass planning. Uh, whenever you see that new obstacle, it made uh, the change of the pass, as you can see in this simulation uh, research. So see that uh, once it detects the second obstacle, then it changed the pass. and also tested in the real robot. Okay, let me briefly explain the, my future research and then finish this presentation. So far, we've seen that a lot of the successful demonstration in laboratory setup, but I think it's time to bring this robot to the outside and then let them face that the real world to real environment. Whenever we design the, the locomotion controller, we has this kind of the we share in the this kind of the assumptions. The ground is supposed to be flat and solid and it doesn't slip. And the collision is always perfectly inelastic and the environment is steady. But real world is really dynamic. It's always rough terrain. And the perception uncertainty is way higher than the laboratory setup. And then the robot desired to utilize the complex motion code motion, like the people in this video. So they can you know, dynamically determine that the, what behavior they want to do, and then the, uh, demonstrating this 
highly agile uh, behavior. So I want to see this kind of the motion in the robot as well. But to do that, I need one more layer on top of this existing control architecture. The robot must understand the environment by using the perception system and rapidly respond to the external environment change and utilizing various locomotion behavior. To test this, I uh, upgrade the mini cheetah by having the, this perception system fully integrated in the body. And one idea to utilize the multiple behavior is to find the to find that the couple of optimal trajectory offline and make it more general formulation. As a first step toward the goal, uh, this is the trajectory optimization of the humanoid robot. It's submitted to the DC or humanoid uh, conference. In here, trajectory optimization recognizes all the limitations of the actuator. Uh, jumping part is the, the operating trajectory optimization and then the leap planning, uh, the following the, the optimal trajectory. The landing part is the real time. I use the, again, the MPC and the whole body control for making this balance. Where eighty percent confidence, this can be also realized in the real systems once we get the real robot, because we do the same process with the mini cheetah backflip, and then the mini cheetah backflip is actually succeeded in the first trial after we go through the, all the detail checking the in simulation. So I hope that once we got this humanoid robot and can demonstrate the same behavior what you can see in this simulation. Okay, second is making the, uh, developing the design tools, a uh, computationally motivated design tool. This work is, this project is motivated by the conversation with these, uh, my good colleagues who are all talented hardware designer. One day they asked me the, what is the required bandwidth of the actuator torque and the velocity limit, actuator size and structure stiffness to get the, to demonstrate really highly dynamic and agile motions with a humanoid robot. They are all important uh, design criteria. You must specify before you build the robot, but realize that I don't have an answer for that question. And Actually, nobody has the answer. Nobody has the answer for that question. So the situation is this: other designers design the robot based on their skills and experience, and give that robot to control engineer. And the control engineer develops the software for this given hardware. But there is no solid established pipeline from the control engineer to hardware designer. For examples. If I had this analysis before I getting this robot, then I must tell them uh, this robot cannot work because the structure stiffness is too low. So basically, there is no way to make this robot stable, the maintain its balance. So the goal is to find uh, some developing the some computational tools to help the hardware designer does not make this kind of the mistake. The program, uh, this project is still ongoing, very beginning steps, but I had the good, uh, initiations with that the UIUC and MIT, and I bring that their preliminary design of the humanoid and put it in the simulation, tested it, and, you know, basic torque limitation, velocity limitation calculation is done in the simulation. I let them know that you need to do, you need to change the battery, for instance, to get the more power. But the back EMF is too large to accomplish the, this high level, uh, high speed motion. Okay, uh, that's all I prepared today, and I'm happy to answer the, any question. Hey, all right, that's uh, great, and uh, thanks to him for this uh, wonderful presentation. I think.
a lot of cool control and uh, uh, robot hardware experimental results. And uh, uh, I think it's great to see the whole body control is um, generalizable to uh, a series of uh, like uh, locomotion robots. And uh, I think, as you said, like with minimal modifications, uh, it's very generalizable and uh, scalable. Um, that's great. So, um, yeah, so I think we have some time for uh, questions. Um, Frank? Yeah, yeah uh, this is Frank. Um, thank you for the great talk. That's, uh, that's amazing. And, and uh, um, thank you. The, the one question I have is, is about convex MPC. It seems that Mm -hmm. On the mini cheetah, people have used this convex MPC method, and and so I'm wondering what do you think about that, and how do you contrast it with with your approach on the cheetah robot? Uh, so I like the convex MPC. I'm big fan of the MPC. It works very well, and uh, I don't have any. How can I say it? bad opinion about the MPC. And it's a really good compensators for whole body control because the whole body control cannot, again, I cannot see that, cannot understand the motion. And it is, I'm currently thinking that the, how to increase the, the time horizon of the whole body control. So basically embedding the MPC in the whole body control part. So again, uh, I also solving the convex optimization here, right? If I replace this convex optimization with a model predictive control, then it's basically become a whole body model predictive control. So that's the, that's the things I'm currently thinking about. Mm. Did this answer for your question? Yeah, it, but it seems that they also sort of have a philosophy change in, in a way to Sort of puts a lot more emphasis on the controller. It will sort of handle a lot more error in the trajectory planning, which is now simplified. So, so there seems to be also be a subtle shift from from whole body control of everything to more just the COM planning, and then put more weight on the controller. And so I, I was wondering whether this is, this is a philosophy. Is this just a technology, or is that a philosophy shift? Shift, right? Mm, you mean the model complexity versus? Are you talking about the model complexity or more? I think I don't understand that part. I don't. I didn't understand it clearly. That philosophy part. Okay. Why? Is uh, yeah, maybe maybe complex? maybe I'm not I'm not an expert, so I I probably misunderstand the details. Uh, That's okay. Maybe I do not. I mean, one thing I want to say is that I don't much care about the, what algorithm I'm using. Uh, I actually make an emphasis about this. We are not solving the control problems. We are solving the dynamic locomotion problem. So whatever technology, algorithm, as long as it's working, then I don't care. I, I want to make sure that uh, I'm getting the, in the right way to get this robot to perform better. So I don't. I do not have a uh, okay strong preference to the whole body control. If I get the better option, then I'm going to. I'm willing to change my uh, philosophy. Uh, okay, let me let me maybe follow up uh, a little bit on this. And uh, I, I think the, my, my question is whether the the current uh, like control structure you have here. Like it's, I think it's a little bit more theoretical, right? It's you think it's a it's a Powerful enough for you to achieve, uh, let's say that you. I think at one of the last few slides in the future work, you mentioned this athletic uh, motions, mm -hmm. very agile motions. So do you see the, with this current control architecture, uh, you can achieve that maybe in the next, I don't know, like three, five years? Or there's still something we need to work more or maybe more on the perception, on the planning. Or the control, or maybe the control structure need to be to be changed. So, do you have any thoughts? So, definitely, uh, we need more layer on top of the controller. So, the control architecture I showed today is more about the locomotion, how to make this robot work better and run better. 
Uh, but I cannot use this controller to make this robot deliver the copy from this building to the other building, right? So we need high level decision maker. And actually, there should be a lot more than that. Test planning, obstacle avoidance, moving obstacle perceptions. So every, everything should be integrated eventually. Uh, the things I'm more care about is that how to connect these uh, different components. So again, once you connect, if the one of the biggest misunderstanding for the system integration in the robotics is that people easily think that if you have a component technology, then you will get that completed, completed robotic system. But as you note, even though you summing up the old state of art technology, you cannot get the state of art robotic system. So we need to carefully choose the each component and then carefully connect these two uh, these different components. All right. Um, I'll let other people ask questions, but I have more questions, but I don't want to monopolize. So please ask questions. And otherwise, I'll ask my next question. Can I, can uh, I, ask I, have, I have a question? Great. Yeah, great. So uh, I wanted to ask what kind of uh, algorithm that was using the state estimator for Mini Cheetah. And did you have to incorporate the visual odometry to uh, address some of the drip or yaw that's happening with the internal state estimator in Mini Cheetah? Great questions. Uh, we put a lot of effort in the estimation, but usually there is no way to put this effort to this line of the story. Uh, we use extended Kalman filters. Uh, in the case of the mini cheetah, we use the linear Kalman filter because we do not estimate the orientation. Orientation is coming from the IMU, and we use this. We just believe the IMU data. Of course, there is the yard drift, but uh, as I said, it mini cheetah cannot see, uh, cannot make a travel from the one building to the other building. So for the, this short time period, that drift is okay, okay to be there. So we use the orientation, and we do not do the any things for the orientation estimation, but we do that the uh, common filters for that uh, footstep height uh, estimation and the body position estimation. In the vision aided locomotion, we use the localization sensor, the rear sense T265, to get the, the global location of the robot. And although it's fully disassembled, but this mini cheetah has the, the two localization sensor in the body. So we putting the everything together and then apply the extended command to first to get the position. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah, so like you yeah, post your bipedal robot, <clears throat> bipedal and quadruped works like follow this kind of hierarchical um, architecture, right? So in the motion planner, um, you have um, some kind of simplified model and then you have the whole body controller. So what if we have the, the full dynamics model in the motion planner? Um, mm -hmm. Like, um, will there be any redundancy if you still do the whole body control? Because your motion planner already gives you all the, like the joint trajectory, like some kind of before torque. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, very great point. So yeah, of course there is the other. Uh, you can come up with the other control hierarchy. So for instance, the hybrid zero dynamics has used that the entire body dynamics in the motion planner level, mm -hmm. and it works greatly. Mm. That's also one options to make this robot work. Uh, I prefer to use the simplified model in the motion control. Uh, motion planning level is because uh, once you're adding the more model de uh, details in the high level, then high levels 
uh, stuck in the specific model, high level planner. It's not only about the generality of the controller, it's, it's also about the performance or features of the uh, motion planner. For instance, in the hybrid zero dynamics, you need to you need to do you need to make the system is always do the periodical motion. So that's the how the hybrid zero dynamics works. But you know, robot must turn and turn to the left and turn to the right to sometimes jump. Of course, you can put the every detail dynamics in this level in the trajectory optimization level, which we also do the somehow in the humanoid backflip. But again, we need to make sure that the that computation is done in the right time. So mm -hmm. if the algorithm spends more than the one second, and there is no way to use that algorithm in real time. This is actually really big problems, huge uh, established uh, constraint. So that's why I still using the simplified model in motion control, motion planning. Okay, yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Um, I have a question. Um, it's actually more hardware focused, surprisingly enough. Um, so I'm kind of curious. Um, a lot of the, the the control algorithms have really kind of been developed, especially in the last decade. Um, we seem to have like those kind of 90% solutions almost, where we get most of the way, and then like the last 10% is like the really really hard part where we we have to worry about certain edge conditions or extremely dynamic parts, uh, or extremely dynamic scenarios. And I'm curious if it's actually realistically um, hardware limited in any way, shape, or form, and whether or not some of the newer pushes in hardware can really be leveraged in the leg space more for trying to solve computer uh, or these, con these control-based problems. So, for example, like FPGA accelerated optimization or something like that, right? Which I know that there have been some publications about, or GPU acceleration. Um, and like what your opinions are on that and whether that's something that other labs should be really looking into and trying to, to push harder on to get the, the best performance of their control or whether or not that's something that's kind of just extra. Uh, when you talk about the hardware, is that about the computer or is it about the robot structure? I mean, it's more, the... it's more on the computer side of things. But I can also talk about like hardware on like the actuation side of things, for example. So like we're getting new electric vehicle motors from technology from the uh, electric vehicle scene, right? Um, axial flux and axial and uh, transverse flux motors are starting to become a lot more common and realizable, which have a lot of significant uh, effects as well on you know the control and what these actuators can do in terms of mm -hmm. torque weight and bandwidth. I mean, it's kind of more of a general overlapping question in your opinions of hardware going into the control space. Yeah, uh, I'm really happy to talk about the hardware. Uh, been in the two years in the MIT, we talk a lot about what is the best robotic hardware for uh, to perform the dynamic locomotions and dynamic behavior. Uh, there is the, some things we couldn't come up with the solutions. Uh, the question is very specific. Is that the, it should should it be hydraulic actuator or electric motor it can do can do? Sangbei is currently designing the humanoid robots with the electric motors, and uh, we'll see. We'll see that the dead robots actually can outperform the Atlas, and we'll get the, at least partial solutions. Twice your answer for that question. I am actually looking forward to see that the, how his humanoid robot uh, perform. So hardware is a still ongoing project, and there are a lot of the unanswered questions. What is the best to put design of the humanoid robot? Do we really need the role direction actuation, or we need to remove it to get the, the lighter leg? So Hardware design is still an interesting part. I think there is a lot of room to improve that the human, current humanoid robot design. For the computer, um, 
the my opinion about the computer's speed is that uh, the computer's speed will not go will not improve the as fast as we've seen so far. Uh, when we see that the number of the core and then is increasing, but uh, when we see that the clock speed, then it's kind of saturated already. So I think it's time to think about how to optimize the algorithm rather than uh, waiting that the better controller and keep developing the more complex but more computationally expensive algorithm. And and also, I believe that it happens. Uh, it's not exactly touring that this, this direction, but reinforcement learning is really computationally efficient. Once you finish the training, then you can just take the neural network and test it in the real robot. And I see that the potential of the reinforcement learning in this in this perspective, you, we can in, uh, we can just uh, shrink the, all these complex optimization process to the neural network and use this complex optimal controller in real time with a very compact system. That's uh, one of the, my goal, actually. Is, is this the answer for your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think that answers it for the most part. I just don't think that people talk a lot about hardware as much in some of these talks, so it's good just to hear more about uh, it from that perspective. In your opinion. Let me, let me ask my second question. Yeah. Your yeah. uncertainty yeah. analysis you did. Um, there was, to me, a jump that I didn't understand because I don't have the background, but you said, here's the uncertainty analysis. And then you said, and that's why we changed a torque controller to a position controller. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that jump. <laughs> yeah, so I made a jump around that point. It's a two, there are really many things I wanna talk in between these lines. When I, when I, give up the torque feedback controller, it takes a really long time because I spend maybe two or three years to make these torque feedback controllers become better. So it's a big decision for me. And then uh, when I decided the torque feedback control is not proper, when I you know conclude that this torque feedback control is not proper in this application, uh, there are a couple of things. Once you have a torque feedback control, torque feedback control tried to remove the entire friction in the drivetrain, which is really good features for a position controller. So the weird thing is happens. Again, the outside of the torque control, it's a whole body control. It's a basically position control. I want to get the really accurate tracking in the position. But I first remove the entire friction in the drivetrain by enabling the torque feedback loop and re-injecting the dissipation with the velocity feedback loop outside of the torque feedback controller. So one thing I, uh, one thing really interesting I found is that even though I do the same things with the same robot, whenever I enable the torque feedback loop, it actually spending more current. So what it happened is that it injecting the energy to reduce the, to remove the friction, and injecting the another energy to make a friction. And because of this, uh, this entire system is a little unstable, actually a lot less stable than just doing the position control. So, so if I get the, the high level, the torque feedback controller, and, and maybe this is maybe this is wrong, but introduced more positional uncertainty at the end effector somehow or not or or the error signal uh, is now, yeah so i think this is easier to understand in this way so whatever controller and the whatever hardware is if you if you can use the infinitely large feedback gain in the position then you are going to get the really good upgrade position controller but you cannot use the infinitely large feedback gain, of course, because it it makes the stability issue. If there is the no other feedback loop in this control structure, 
then the, all the feedback gains, uh, only the feedback gain you need to tune is the position control. If there is no feedback loop in the torque level. But if you have a torque feedback loop inside of the position control, then the, what motor gonna feel is the multiplication of these two feedback gains. So you cannot increase the position gains as much as you want because there is another gain amplifying this entire gain rule. Does this make sense? It makes sense, but I don't think you now made the jump from the positional uncertainty analysis that you did and the positional controllers yet. I mean, yeah. so I, I don't have the background to understand that jump yet, sorry. So the, the things I want to do is the increasing the position gain a lot. And I couldn't because I have a torque feedback loop. So I removed the torque feedback loop and now I can increase the position feedback gain a lot more than before. Which so means you get better a... precision. Maybe the implied statement is then you get better precision on the, posi on the position and then you can maintain whole body balance. Yes. And, 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 and swing planning, et cetera. Okay. All right, okay, I, I think I, I missed that, that link from gain to positional uncertainty, um, yeah. which is probably for you, it's second nature. For me, it's not, right, so yeah. It's a, yeah, I, I know that there is a logic jump, but uh, when I start to explain the, all these details, I'm really happy to do it, but people easily lose that, the, what is the point of the uncertainty analysis? So that's why I jumped a little, yeah. But thank you for pointing out it. Hey, that's good. Yeah, thanks for the question from Frank. And uh, uh, I think we're already 12 minutes uh, past uh, 2 p.m. And uh, I li like, really like the conversation. And I think there are definitely more questions we should uh, um, contact Dunghyung offline, I guess. So um, is, is there any last minute question? I think we are close to um, wrap up the seminar. Okay, all right, yeah, so let's thank our speaker, Dunghyung again, and uh, I think really great talk. And uh, uh, well, this COVID time, we cannot uh, host you uh, on campus seminar, but uh, I think next time we stop by Atlanta, just let us know and uh, we'll definitely- Yeah, I love the city. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you everyone. Thank you for attending the seminar and I will see you later. Bye. Bye.